than the other to grow and still get the same result. Uh, and people have been aware of this sort of scaling for a long time, well over a century, and predominantly in situations of changing the temperature. So as uh, temperature goes up, uh, development speeds up. As temperature goes down, development slows down. Nobody really knows why this is. They are aware that enzyme functionality changes a little. Um, so enzymes tend to go faster with uh, warmer temperatures, lower with colder temperatures. Uh, but the, the whole mechanism of how this affects development has never been worked out. So if we're going to be looking at different flies, we need to figure out how all these different flies that we commonly uh, deal with, uh, how their development changes, whether this is related to the climate they're uh, exposed to, what temperatures they're used to, the environmental stuff. So we have flies from all over the world. And so a good starting point is just looking at melanogasters. So here we have uh, the length of development, um, and it accelerates as temperature goes up. And this has been uh, well established, and in lab I was easily able to recapitulate this with here you have temperature, and of course, uh, take longer polar temperatures. So if we compare this then to different species, or, so this is melanogaster, then simulants, a little bit different, but fairly similar. Ananasi, again, fairly similar. And you can go through a whole bunch of different species, all the sequence species and some other commonly used animals. You see there's actually quite a variety of different responses to temperature. They're not all just slight variations on the melanogaster theme. And some of this might have to do with how we're raising them. So if you look at just melanogaster, if you grow up, for instance here, it's Oregon R, if you grow them up to 25 degrees versus 18 degrees, the embryos will respond differently to high temperatures. And this is entirely a maternal effect. So mothers raised at higher temperatures impart something on their embryos so that they grow faster at warmer temperatures than those colder temperatures. But that doesn't just explain all the differences we see between all these species. So you can pretty much boil down the differences to sort of four major types. So you have the melanogaster, which is sort of our standard that one we know. Uh, Pseudo-obscura, we also see this in Persimilis. These are uh, alpine species. They're used to cold weather, and they have lots of trouble with the heat. So if the temperature gets too hot, they just all die. And below that, their development slows disproportionately compared to uh, other species. But then also interesting is Virilis and Moavensis, which we see they have a much stronger temperature response. So while from 20, 27 degrees to 17 degrees, Melanogaster takes roughly twice as long, uh, Moavensis actually takes about three times as long. So, and a much stronger response than the other flies we saw. So this leads to sort of two questions. One is a sort of a practical question. How do we compare two different flies that are unrelated if we're doing you know, comparative analysis of any sort? And the other question is, how did this come to be? How did these evolve so that they're so robust, both to a wide range of temperatures, but also these very different lengths of developmental time even between two different species at the same temperature. So looking at sort of the evolution history, we can see that there's a phylogenetic uh, component to this. So uh, virulus and monovensis are part of the virulus repeater radiation, and those seem to have much stronger response to temperature, um, a much uh, more drastic response to temperature than any of the other species. And then the alpine species that we see in the uh, poor response to heat are also closely related. So there appears to be something that has evolved that's different in this group than in the other groups. So to sort of dive more into this, uh, I set up a rig on the microscope where I can control the temperature very precisely and image a whole bunch of embryos all at once. So you put the embryos on these little wells, they get lots of oxygen because of the membrane they're sitting on. And then you can control the temperature very precisely uh, with an electric controllers and down to uh, tenth of a degree Celsius accuracy. So you can watch them develop. And so you can create videos of the embryos developing. Now, a lot of these species, we don't have any molecular tools, and so we can't mark nuclei, we can't do a bunch of other stuff while we're watching them. So we're pretty much restricted to large morphological things. So the question is, what can we do with this? So going through development, you can go through and identify all the major morphological uh, changes of embryonic development just on like my microscope. And so I wrote a script in MATLAB to go through and it'll estimate when it hits each of these stages. And then I go through the Python GUI and uh, determine whether the program is correct or not, and correct it if it's wrong, and verify each of these different uh, points. And so you have 
all these stages that we can then uh, look at very large numbers of embryos and identify exactly when they hit these points at a variety of different temperatures. So, and then eventually they hatch. So, uh, so I selected sort of a subset of stages. So these stages are the ones we're highlighted in the video. Um, and it sort of spans a variety of different processes during development. There are a bunch of unrelated sort of events. And we can create a timeline of development of when embryos hit each of these different stages. And you can do replicates, so a bunch of uh, flies over 25 degrees, for instance. And you can do this with a bunch of different temperatures. So we can see that total development time, we know, sort of follows that exponential curve. And then each of the events also seems to look like it's sort of following the trend. The question is, are we having some morphological events that are getting longer or shorter, or are they spawning differently in these temperatures? So what we can do is then normalize how we look at development. And here we start at uh, one point and another. Uh, it happens to the end of cellularization to the tracheal field at reliable points. And we can look at this across all temperatures. And we see that everything normalizes perfectly. So every single event scales the exact same way, whether it's cold or hot. The only exception we see is at very hot temperatures, the sensation, uh, sensational stages tend to accelerate proportionally more than the rest of the stages. So once you're about 30 degrees, they start to have uh, speed up. So that's the only time we don't see perfect scaling across all these species, so uh, across all these temperatures. So this is not a trivial thing. If you look at the enzymes that are functioning in these processes, they all have different responses to temperature. Some of them accelerate more, some of them accelerate less, uh, as temperature changes. So this isn't what you'd expect if you just threw a bunch of enzymes together and expected things to start growing. And then if we look at different species, we see that it's conserved across all these species, including species that have a much stronger response to temperature. They still scale the exact same way. So the question is, what's going on here? Um, there's no stage dependence for this, so it's not like uh, if you there's no critical period, so if you change the temperature midway through development, the embryos essentially immediately react and will then scale proportionally to the new temperature. Um, so we could either have a single master regulator that controls everything, uh, or we could have multiple regulators, essentially independent processes, but these are all perhaps selected to uh, work cohesively at the same temperature, or we can have every single enzyme in the organism that's selected for uh, having the exact same temperature response. This seems unlikely given that these flies are found around the world in a variety of different climates, and even over the course of the day, vary greatly in temperature. So to sort of dis dissect this, we looked at a couple of things, including gene expression, mass spectrometry, and uh, adjusted oxygen levels. So if you take a look at expression levels, so you can have an embryo that's, for instance, at 27 degrees, you have an embryo that reaches the same stage at twice the time, and yet their gene expression is as pretty much virtually as similar as a uh, replicant at the same temperature. So we don't see any gross changes in gene expression, even though the time is completely different. Uh, we do see a few outliers, a couple genes that are more highly or lower expressed at higher or lower temperatures. Um, these genes cover a variety of different processes, uh, metabolic and developmental processes, but they're not really related to each other. There's no connection between them. There's a sort of story, story connecting them all. Uh, similar with the heat conditioning, we can look for heat condition versus non-heat condition animals. Again, a couple of genes come out, and they cover a wide variety of metabolic processes, but they do not really relate to each other. There's no real connection between them. And we can also look at in mothers to know that it's a maternal uh, component to this and look at the uh, embryos, uh, look at the mothers, you can see that both vitamin membrane and chorion protein genes are upregulated. So the mothers are imparting at least something into the embryos to respond to higher temperatures. So the other thing we can do is look at non-genes like mass spectrometry. And we see that some lipids are completely unchanged by temperature. However, other lipids uh, do change. And so embryos are actively responding to these temperature changes. So things are not all quite the same. So colder temperatures, you have a much higher expression of certain uh, phospholipids, including uh, phosphatidylglycerol, <coughs> phosphatidylethanolamine, and phosphatidylinositol, among others. So there is definitely a response to the temperature changes that the embryos are doing. The other thing we can try doing is I tried limiting oxygen 
So on the temperature setup, I made a little box so you can pump in nitrogen and oxygen and keep a very precise level of oxygen while also regulating the temperature, see what happens. And we see, of course, that as we get less oxygen, development takes longer. And then if you look at how this actually scales, you can see <coughs> that uh, development uh, scaling sort of falters. So at very low levels of oxygen, uh, some processes start taking proportionally less time, others take proportionally more time, so things uh, begin to fall apart. So in conclusion, what we can see is development scales evenly across both wide range of temperatures and across all the species that we've looked at. And gene expression scales perfectly. However, lipids do reflect that there's a dynamic change happening in the embryo. Um, and then if you go to sort of non-physiological extremes, for instance, extremely high heat or hypoxia, things start to fall apart, suggesting this isn't all just happening by accident. Instead, it probably is very strong selection for a very exact cadence of embryonic development, as one might expect. So uh, I'd like to thank uh, people, members of the Eisen Lab, uh, Tony Aparam ran the uh, mass spec, and uh, Kelly, who we talked this morning, Peter and uh, Ali both have it. Posters you can go check out, and I'd like to thank Michael Eisen and the rest of the lab. Yeah, so we checked in uh, Prisnolis and Modensis and Viralis and Amanasi, so a, a wide range of them. And pretty much you get the same sort of level of deflection. So even though like Pseudosphere has trouble with the heat, if you cold condition them more, they have even more trouble. So it's, it's proportional. Any, any particular reason you focus on, on lipid in your mass spec analysis? Like, Okay. Well, we're sort of in the process of doing more, so that was the, the first major result we had. So we're still in the process of doing more. So the lipids were just a very striking sort of uh, thing we saw. Very striking. Yeah. 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 Y